Hello and welcome to another Royal Society Publishing video podcast. Today I'm talking with Dr Andrew Smith and Dr Paul Barrett who are both based at Natural History Museum in London. They've guest edited a special feature in the February issue of Biology Letters and it's all about how models can be used in paleontology. So what hurdles did researchers have to overcome before models were so widely applied? Okay, well, um, paleontologists for long were uh, busy working out the patterns in the fossil record. And of course they were interested in the processes as well, but because those processes have, are the result of very complex interacting factors, it was uh, quite often just uh, sort of done on an ad hoc basis with um, um, trying to work out individual scenarios for for how patterns have arisen. Um, so really what's happened in the last uh, 20 years is, uh, is a switch over to trying to use models to understand the, to, to dissect out the individual signals that are going in to create these patterns that we see in the fossil record. And um, the, um, the use of models is allowing us to um, isolate the individual um, drivers that might be uh, going in to create the patterns that we see. So it's a, it's a very um, elegant way of approaching um, understanding of uh, what might be creating the complex patterns that we see in the fossil record. I think we had two major issues. One of those major issues was simply trying to get well-constrained edges around particular questions. We could come up with very qualitative statements about what particular things from the fossil record might mean, but we found it very difficult to put hard numbers, statistics, on these kinds of things that would be the kinds of data that other sorts of scientists would expect us to have. So that's something that was lacking, and I think there's been a general perception among other branches of science that paleontologists generally just use just so stories. And what modelling allows us to do is to show that we actually do look at these questions on the same terms, and we can actually start to approach these issues with the same kinds of techniques that our colleagues in the biological and earth sciences use routinely. The second kind of issue it stems from that, which is that often we weren't at the top table, if you like, in a number of debates over evolutionary biology or earth history because we were perceived to be doing work that was largely anecdotal. But now we can actually come up with models and we can come up with data that look much more similar to those familiar with our other co that are familiar to our other colleagues, and as a result, we start to be able to engage with those broader debates and to be taken more seriously. And how are models currently being used in the field? Uh, models are used in a really wide number of ways. So they're used from everything from looking at the evolutionary dynamics of species all the way through to thinking about the mechanical performance, say, of a dinosaur skull during feeding. So we can take these mathematical modelling techniques and apply them to a really wide variety of questions from evolutionary biology and also from biomechanics and ecology. So there are lots of different approaches we can now use, using, for, to start with, fairly simple approaches, but also borrowing things that have already been widely in use in things like engineering and actually making new applications of these existing techniques. When we're faced with patterns which are the result of multiple different factors, for example, if you just look at the diversity of life through time, it, it, with a fossil record what we see uh, is the um, distribution of fossils through time, so we can actually get um, the numbers of fossils that are found, but that is um, a mixed signal because it's partially created by biological factors and it's partially created by geological factors, by biases in the, in the rock record. So if we want to really understand the true diversity through time, then we need to isolate the different signals that are going in to create that pattern that we um, see, the empirical pattern of fossils through time. Um, and uh, modelling is being used in that um, particular instance to try and remove the rock record bias and get to the biological signal so that we can understand the biological pattern that's going through time. And it's the same, uh, it's being widely used in functional morphology as well to try and um, uh, understand the evolution of form through time. And are there any downsides to using these models? Well, whenever you use models, you have to make assumptions. And in biological systems, um, you're making assumptions when you're, when you're simplifying a system down to modeling. Uh, with paleontology, we have the added difficulty that many of the 
parameters that we want to put into our model are very poorly constrained themselves. Um, so there's a much greater uncertainty when we're dealing with, with paleontological modeling because we're dealing with unobservable events in deep time. So um, the way models, I think, are used most effectively is not to develop very precise understandings of the processes, but to limit the uncertainties associated with inferring from the fossil record. This is particularly true with um, the functional morphology side, um, where we don't, all we have are the skeleton to work with, and you're trying to reconstruct, um, uh, for example, um, bite dynamics of a jaw. It, there are so many uncertainties there that what we're trying to do is put boundaries on our uncertainty rather than be very precise about how a particular jaw action um, worked, for example. For me, a big downside of using models is I have to think about things a lot more. Um, most paleontologists are trained in fairly qualitative ways, and only a small number of our colleagues up to now have really had the quantitative toolkit to do this kind of work, but they're now retraining themselves so they can actually use high-power statistical techniques and come up with the sorts of models that start to give these more interesting results. One of the big downsides are the assumptions we have to build in, but we know we're working within a set of assumptions and a set of limited data just because of the nature of the material we have to work with. But I think as long as we're explicit about those assumptions and we don't try and brush them under the carpet, we can still be very honest about the sorts of results we come up with. So we can see from the range of topics covered in this special feature that modelling already has many applications. What do you think the future holds for this tool? OK, it's really difficult to tell where uh, modelling's going to go. Um, in the last 20 years, we've seen a great um, shift forward in the sophistication of the models that are being applied in paleontology. Um, one of the great uncertainties that remains uh, has to do with the nature of the taxa themselves that are being used in these models. The way taxa are defined can have quite a significant effect on the outcome of the models and that comes across from some of the papers in, in this uh, series. Uh, so it would be really nice to see models paying more attention to the rigor with which the tax are defined in the models that they use. I strongly suspect we're just going to see more and more modelling coming into paleo as more people become familiar with the techniques and also become interested in the kinds of questions they can really address and the limits to those questions as we come up with different answers from looking at things in a purely qualitative way. So I think the future holds lots more modelling. There'll be more modelling in all of the kinds of issues that we addressed in the special issue, everything from looking at the ecology of uh, ancient communities through to the performance of an animal that's running. Again, through to looking at things like extinction and speciation dynamics. So I think it's just going to become much more common and much more accepted part of the paleontologist toolkit. Thank you, Andrew and Paul, and thank you for watching this Royal Society Publishing video podcast.